Hello, my name is John Antonakis. I'm Professor of Organizational Behavior at the University of Lausanne. Today, I'm going to talk about a topic that many researchers don't know about or care to avoid, endogeneity. It sounds bad. It is bad. It's like a deadly virus that threatens the viability of models that make causal claims regarding the relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable. Who needs to know about endogeneity? Researchers, students, but most important, policymakers and practitioners. Endogeneity is always lurking around in the background. Therefore, it is important to know what it is, why it is deadly for research, and how to deal with it. We are bombarded all the time with apparent causal claims that have implications for practice. For example, choosing a certain strategy or control system in a company that apparently predicts the company's performance. Good leader member relations or LMX, which apparently uh, predicts reduced turnover intentions on the part of subordinates or increased satisfaction. Having more women on management boards apparently predicts profitability of companies. Management researchers and consultants often make such claims, but are these findings actually valid? How can we know if that is the case? As you will see at the end of this podcast, very often such claims, if they haven't been observed in certain conditions, will usually be false. To better understand the problem of endogeneity, imagine a philosopher who is taken out on a field and is supposed to observe a phenomenon that is going to occur 50 times. Her goal is to piece together what she sees and provide a theoretical explanation of what she has observed. So the philosopher walks out on the field and she stares out all around her. She hears a few birds, the wind rustling, nothing much. Suddenly, a disc streaks across the sky. She hears a loud crack and the disc shatters into smithereens. Puzzled at this occurrence, she looks again. Suddenly, she hears a streak in the sky. The disc appears. She hears the round crack and the disc shatters again. This happens several times. Most of the times that she hears the loud crack, the disc shatters. After thinking about this phenomenon for quite some time, the philosopher comes up with a conclusion, a theoretical explanation which stems from the loud crack. She comes to this conclusion after having observed 50 trials and she's really convinced that it must be the sound that is destroying the disc. Let's take a look at the data that she gathered. So here is the data that shows exactly what the philosopher saw and what she recorded. Over here, there was no loud crack. As you can see, out of 19 trials, the disc remained intact and it was never destroyed. Over here is when she heard the loud crack. On 29 trials where the loud crack occurred, the disc was shattered, and on two trials where the loud crack occurred, the disc did not shatter. As you can see, there's a very strong relationship between two variables, that is, hearing the sound and shattering. When the sound is present, the disc usually shatters. In fact, the probability is extremely high. And when the sound is not there, it's almost with 100% certainty that the disc does not shatter. We can actually estimate the relationship between these two variables. This is actually called a phi coefficient and it is 0.92. It is almost perfect. Therefore, what can we conclude? When the sound is present, it's highly likely that the disc shatters. When the sound is not present, it is highly likely that it doesn't. Now, here's a question to you. Can the philosopher actually conclude that the sound is making the disc shatter? The observed, and I highlight the observed correlation is very strong and it's statistically significant. That is, this relationship is very reliable and it is not due to chance. 
but does it actually reflect the true relationship between the sound and the disc shattering? It seems like the crack causes the disc to shatter. Let's talk about the variables in terms of X, the cause, and Y, the apparent outcome. Assume the following causal diagram where X in fact causes Y, and there's something that causes Y too that we don't observe. We call this a disturbance term, the E term over here, or perhaps unmeasured causes. As you can see, the reason why this exists is because we don't perfectly predict when the disc will shatter as a function of the sound. We have a little bit of error, and that was shown in the bar graph. Those are the misses that we have. The problem with this causal specification is that X here is actually not exogenous. It depends on something. And if this something is not accounted for in the model, the relationship that we will estimate between X and Y will be in fact very biased. Now here comes the big problem, endogeneity. What causes X might also cause Y. That is, U and E, these unknown causes, may be correlated or may be due to the same variable. And this variable is what we call an omitted cause. When adding Z in the model, we account for what causes both X and Y. In fact, the relationship between X and Y is non-existent. It is naught, zero. To better understand why the relation between X and Y is actually zero, I estimated a multivariant regression where, firstly, Z predicts X, how loud the sound was, using a linear model. Z predicts Y, whether the disc shattered, using a linear probability model, estimated with the OLS. And the disturbances of X and Y, U and E, are correlated. The residual correlation between X and Y is actually zero when we account for what causes X and Y. For detailed notes and to download the data, please refer to the following link on my webpage. So this is the true model. Z causes both X and Y. X is how loud the crack was that the philosopher heard, which is caused by a gunshot, the omitted variable Z. What she hears is also caused by U, an unmeasured cause, perhaps background noise, which perturbed a little bit what she heard. The disc shattering is caused by Z as well. And E, a random unmeasured cause, could have been the wind when the shooter was shooting and which disturbed the direction of the bullets, which is why they missed. So this was a random cause which is unmeasured in the model and uncorrelated with Z. Going back to the philosopher in the field, despite her good intentions to try and model this phenomenon correctly, what she did was wrong. There is no correlation between the sound and the disc shattering. Both are caused by a gunshot that she did not know of. There we can see the shooter. And it is the shooter who is in fact destroying the disc, which is launched on the side by a disc launcher. When faced with endogeneity problems of this kind, the problem is that the relation we observe could be positive, could be negative, could be non-significant. In fact, we don't know what the true relationship is when we omit important causes. What causes endogeneity? There are three major reasons. The first one we just saw was omitted variables. And these come in many different kinds of forms. I just showed you one example where we omitted a common cause. But there are many different kinds of omitted variable biases. For example, omitting fixed effects. Many researchers, especially those who use what's called HLM models or hierarchical linear models, estimate these models using random effects or random coefficients without checking whether the level one variables correlate with fixed or constant effects 
that are due to the higher level entity. The second interesting case of omitted variable bias is where we have omitted selection. In this case, there is a choice that has been had by the entity we are observing. For example, women who choose to work or who choose not to work. How can we estimate the relationship between education and how much a woman earns if we can only observe women who are working? We need to also observe the counterfactual. What would women who are not working, what would they have had in terms of their salary had they chosen to work? So we need to model this endogenous choice. This comes in many different forms. For example, leaders may choose to attend a leadership training program or not. Firms may choose to export or not. Um, certain companies may choose to use a certain strategy or not. This choice is endogenous. It cannot be used to predict anything. It's just like the gunshot noise. The third major cause is what is called simultaneity. By simultaneity, we mean that the model that we have, X predicting Y, could work one way. In other words, X is a cause of Y. However, Y is also a cause of X. So we have a backward causal loop going from Y to X. As you can see, X is caused by Y and an omitted cause that we don't observe, and Y is caused by X and also by an omitted cause that we don't observe. The problem we have when we estimate a relationship between X and Y and simultaneity might be actually driving the results is that the coefficient that we estimate is actually wrong because it consists of two coefficients. So we might observe a coefficient of 0.50, but that doesn't mean anything. One could be going positive direction, another could be going a negative direction. For example, leaders change their leadership style as a function of follower performance. If a follower has bad performance, the leader might use a negative leadership style, one that gives negative feedback. If the follower has good performance, the leader might adjust their style as a function of that good performance. Thus, what we observe is actually not trustworthy. It is consisting of two components. Very often, researchers say, well, the observed correlation that we have might be because X is causing Y or because Y is causing X. No, that is wrong. These researchers don't get it. The correlation we observe is not true. It's not correct because one correlation could be positive, the other could be negative. And these could be of different signs, of different magnitudes. In fact, what the researchers are doing is correlating the sound of the gunshot with an outcome. There are many other causes of endogeneity, including measurement error, which is a special case where X is actually exogenous but is not precisely or reliably measured. Um, there's also what is called common method variance. Many researchers don't realize how bad common method variance can be. But in fact, if there is a problem of common method variance, we just don't know what the true relation can be. For example, suppose I ask you to rate your boss on a certain leadership style, and then I ask you if you like your boss. Or I might ask the questions in the other sense. Do you like your boss? Say so you say yes. Are you very impressed with the leadership style of your boss? Is your boss a good leader? Well, you're more likely to say yes, given the first response. Now, it was very blatant the way I asked the question by saying, do you like your boss? Um, questions may be asked in more indirect ways, but they may be driven by a lurking variable, Z which is driving the relationship between X and Y. And we just don't know what the true relationship will be if we have an omitted cause, if we have endogeneity. How do we get rid of endogeneity? Very simple. The fail-safe way to do it is with an experiment. In an experiment, X is exogenously manipulated. In other words, it varies randomly. Because it varies randomly, it will not correlate with anything in the dependent variable that we haven't measured. Let me give you an example. Suppose we want to try the efficacy of a treatment, whatever that may be, leadership training, a medicine, what have you. So we have a sample of individuals, let's say 100, and what we will do is we will use some kind of random mechanism to assign these people to a 
treatment group and a control group. We might have alternative treatments, that doesn't matter. Suppose we have a treatment group and a control group. Because we randomly are assigning the people to either the treatment group or the control group, the groups at the beginning are exactly the same on any observed or unobserved variable. And that is very critical because if the groups are exactly the same on every observed or unobserved variable, if there is a difference in them after we administer the treatment, that difference can be due to only one thing, that is the treatment, because there is nothing else that might possibly explain why we observe a difference in the groups. The groups were exactly the same in the beginning. So the strength of the experimental design is that we can observe what is called the counterfactual. What would the treated group have received had it not received the treatment? That's what we observe in the untreated group. We can make a valid causal claim with an experiment. Remember, with an experiment we can be sure that no omitted causes correlate with the treatment, the groups are the same in the beginning, we can observe the counterfactual at the group level, causal claims are valid. Experimental methods are one way to deal with endogeneity. There are other ways, a bit more complex, that borrow a lot from econometrics. I will not get into these in this version of the podcast. If you are interested to find out more, please refer to the longer version of this podcast. To summarize, effects is not exogenous, its relation to Y is suspect. And it has to be corrected using some kind of corrective technique which will kill endogeneity. There are many, many cases of this in the literature and the paper to which I referred to published in the Leadership Quarterly, we found that even in very, very good journals, in top journals in management and applied psychology, that estimates were severely compromised by using incorrect modeling procedures. So recall, we cannot regress Y, satisfaction of followers or what have you, on LMX, leader member exchange. LMX is endogenous. We cannot use a uh, hierarchical linear modeling estimator which looks at random effects when level one variables could correlate with the fixed effects. The fixed effects are an omitted cause. We cannot regress uh, company performance on an endogenous choice, for example, using a certain control strategy or not using it, because the choice is endogenous. It has to be modeled correctly. And that's exactly where James Heckman, in fact, won the Nobel Prize in, in 2000. The procedure that's named for him, the Heckman two-step, he found out a way in which he could correct for this endogeneity and reproduce a true counterfactual, just like in an experimental design. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this University of Lausanne podcast. If you are interested to find out more information about endogeneity and how to correct for it, please refer to the following paper. The paper is available on my website, or if you wish, you may email me and I'll be very glad to give it to you. Before closing, make sure to think about the supposed causal effect that someone is trying to convince you of. Was the claim made in the context of an experimental design? If not, is it possible that there are omitted causes that haven't been correctly modeled? Were instruments used to assure that the causal direction of the effect of an endogenous regression can be identified on a dependent variable? If there's any cause for doubt, don't trust the results of the study that has published them. Remember, Endogeneity is like a disease. It must be stomped out in every one of its forms. It's not ethical, neither economical, to base policies or practices on procedures that might not work. Thank you for listening to this podcast.